It's fine. Okay, so I can start now. Um, can you hear me well? Even at the back? Right. Okay, um, it's my great pleasure to, uh, to be invited to speak in this forum, uh, Paradigm Shift, and it needs a lot of energy in order to create a paradigm. And uh, um, the theme of this year is uh, humans plus machines by design, but not by default, with its awakening call from Carmen, and I cite here, if you are not asking yourselves these sort of questions, you might be living your life on autopilot. It's a time to wake up, end of quote, a quote from, uh, from Carmen. I dare not uh, say that I will wake you up, but I will try to add more noise, or even, uh, or maybe some more confusions. Um, the focus of this forum is design. But to design is, to, first of all, to desire. But in what capacity can we desire? Uh, desire has been turned more and more, as Carmen has said, into consumption. For example, addition to shopping, or video games, or even Facebook. And in the gigantic uh, automatic technological automatic system that we are living in, we are experiencing a sort of uh, a systematic determination, which seeks to go beyond the unconsciousness through the manipulation of uh, personal data and big data that is produced by consciousness. And it produces a, a, a short-circuiting of desire by going ahead of us. This is fully demonstrated by Amazon, by Google, and future smart object, and notably by the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal, and as well as the social credit to come. This speculation on the future is very much limited by the imagination of a progress moving towards a technological singularity. And in face of this futurism, and we know that everyone, uh, many people have been talking about futurism today. In face of such a futurism, I wish to talk about the question of techno-diversity and to show how techno-diversity constitutes a philosophical, political, and ethical question in related to our standing of human, machines, and politics. So I'm trying to give a conceptual ground of um, what I call techno-diversity. Uh, I have some examples, but I'm not sure that uh, I, if I will have uh, time to, to give such example. Um, why techno-diversity? Uh, skeptics, uh, skeptics will immediately ask the following question. Uh, don't we already have techno-diversity in so far as we have different cultures? and different cultures have different ethnic groups. The skeptics are right by claiming that there are different cultures, as there are different techniques dealing with everyday production, for example, fishing, farming, and weaving. But these kinds of skepticism usually besides of stating very obvious claims without paying attention to the historical development and contradictions of history, and are reluctant to elaborate on what really means by techno-diversity, because for them, techno-diversity only means different skills, different ways of, uh, of achieving the same goal. This result, according to myself, in an incapability to problematize and to engage with what is happening today. Now, if I will have to invoke the question of techno-diversity, it is because I think modernization is fundamentally a process of homogenization. Uh, but I will, of course, this is a delicate um, purpose hypothesis, and we have to uh, look into to this in more details. And with modern communication network and the rise of platform capital, capitalism, we are witnessing an intensified special, special conversions, which is at the same time a temporal synchronization, and which we have been talking about since decades. 
Synchronization and convergence through standardized modern technologies have been challenging techno diversity and also new diversity. Uh, new diversity, new um, uh, from, from, from Greek means uh, thinking. More than ever, since digital technologies allow a much faster speed and wider coverage of inference, globalized modernization, according to Claude Levi Strauss, um, as he has suggested in his book, Trist Topic, brings forward a new meaning to the study of anthropology, which he calls anthropology, but with a, with a ye, at it, that is the study of entropy. He called it, he called anthropology, anthropology, because it is a witness of the, of the entropic becoming of the world in the sense of the disintegration of forms of life uh, in the area in the area where he, he did his research through technological transformation which silently homogenizes different cosmological relations into one that is compatible with modern technology and its imagination. And this is the problem of modernity as a view outside of Europe. And it is undeniable that globalization has taken such a pace that what is called indigenous knowledge is marginalized and the situation will continue to deteriorate. But now, Geopolitics is more than ever characterized by technological competition of automatic or automation technologies and a politics of technological singularity, especially artificial intelligence. For example, in August 2017, the Chinese government has published a white paper which declares that China will become a leading country in artificial intelligence in 2030 a few weeks after, that is to say, the 1st of September, the Russian president, Putin, has delivered a speech to the Russian children in which he claims that whoever lives in AI will rule the world. The lack of diversity means also a lack of response to the problems brought about by modern technologies, as we know that we are living through ecological crisis or ecological mutations, which are often associated with the Anthropocene. Now, as many of you know what it means by the Anthropocene, it means that human activities have come to the extent that they affect the geochemical process of the Earth and have speeded up the diminution of biodiversity as well as the extinction of human species itself. The call launched by many scientists and scholars, including anthropologists uh, such as Philippe Descolin, Bruno Latour, among others, points to the necessity uh, uh, to a critical reflection on epistemologies associated with the modern, which repose on various oppositions, for example, subject object, nature, culture, and etc. Now, the opposition between culture and nature is what Philippe Descola called naturalism. Um, well, one has to be aware that this opposition, or the, what he called naturalism, didn't exist since the beginning um, in Europe, and it is also not the case in non-European cultures. Apart from naturalism, Descola has also elaborated on three other types of ontologies in which Nature plays a very different role from uh, the nature in naturalism, which is waiting to be mastered. So for example, these are the other ontologies, such as uh, analogism, animism, totemism. The four ontologies are caricatures of four different understandings of nature and affirming a uh, um, and therefore, we may be able to claim that this response to the Anthropocene is by affirming uh, what, he call, what they called a multinationalism instead of multiculturalism, but a, a multinationalism. 
If this is possible to affirm that there has been different natures, my question is the following. Would it be possible to ask if there are different technological thought or there are different techniques? And it is on this sense that I talk about techno-diversity. While nature is often, often considered as an exodus to the problem of uh, modernity, but I'm not convinced that it is possible to resolve a, a crisis or crisis initiated by technology with a non-technical concept such as nature, such as Gaia. That is the reason for which I developed the concept of cosmotechnics, which we may call the original technics, or in German, a word technique. If I say that the skeptics didn't want to elaborate on technodiversity, it is just because the question of technodiversity hasn't been well reflected. In our everyday life, everyday use of the term techniques, we understand that there are different techniques, for example, techniques of paper making, navigating, which varies from one another according to different forms, different tools, and different methods. But they conceptually refer to the same techniques. For example, we can say that paper making in the Han Dynasty in China is more advanced in Europe. Or navigation technology of the 16th century China was leading in comparison with other parts of the world. But this kind of comparison have assumed that there is the same type of techniques and the differences are based on a standard which measures progress and or advancement as if they are of the same they are of the same technical object or technical systems and technology will progress until it reaches the point we call singularity now we can talk about the advancement from a diet to a child in which a grid is added to enable the, uh, the to en enable control of the current. But we have to be cautious when we talk about two technologies uh, from two different cultures or civilizations because they come from two sets of different presuppositions. Philosophy in the 20th century attempted to recognize the question of technology by understanding it as a universal medium as well as tools indispensable for the process of hominization, that is to say, to becoming of human. As indicated by the French paleontologist André Le Hoagoron, that hominization is a process which involves, at the same time, the exteriorization of memory through writing, for example, and the liberation of bodily organ. For example, we invent forks and knife in order to free our hand and fingers. Martin Heidegger, the, the German philosopher Martin Heidegger was an exception concerning a non-anthropological investigation of technology. He wants to inquire into the essences of techniques instead of just understanding them in terms of utilities. In his 1949 lecture, The Question Concerning Technology, Heidegger distinguishes two essences of techniques, which consist of a transformation from the Greek techne to modern technology, what he called modern technique. Greek technique, techne is associated with the word, with the word poiesis, or in German, hervorbringen to bring forth, uh, as it is translated into English and in, in French production. It is the efficient cause, along with the material and the formal cause, brings forth the final cause, like the silver smith brings forth a, a silver chalice uh, into present. Modern technology, stands out as something completely different as Heidegger has claimed. That the essence of modern technology has nothing to do with techniques, but rather with what he called the Gestell, which is often translated as enframing, in which every, every being is seen as standing reserve, as calcul calculable entities, and he called it Bistand which 
can be more simply understood in terms of resource. Every being is understood as a resource. And then there is a communication between Marx and Heidegger. This essence of modern technology is closely related, associated with the epistemological and methodological rupture of modernity, namely geometrization, qua mechanization, and experimental science, since it is also during this, process, this period that Heidegger identifies the transformation from techne to modern technology. Now, technological globalization would be seen as a globalization of such epistemologies to the extent that they become only present and become symbols of progress, the continuation of the 18th century discourse. The technological acceleration in global scale calls upon questions concerning the future of human being. It is stated clearly in the title of the forum that the, of this forum that the future of man will be designed uh, uh, and, and, and the question the relation between human and machine has to be rethought. And this of course resonates very much with what is called the post human. But what really is post-human? It means that we are no longer organic beings as we believe, as, uh, as unique as we believe, and we have entered a new politics, or better, a new uh, a struggle between the organic and the inorganic. Therefore, the post-human is not merely a celebration of the death of humanism and the obsoleteness ob ob of men, which we have known since the Industrial Revolution described in the 19th century factories by Karl Marx in Das Kapital, written in 1867. Or even we can trace it later in, 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 um, in Friedrich Inger's unfinished work, Dialectics of Nature, in which we find a chapter, the part played by labor in the transition from ape to man, um, in which he states that harmonization is produced by the use of tour. And therefore, human being is, since the very beginning, already a technical being, since he or she is the being that is capable to invent tours which are inorganic. And these two words are also his or her organs, like the German philosopher Hans Karp elaborated, uh, a, a 19th century Hegelian has elaborated, uh, has tried to understand two words as possession of organs. Now, so there is, he understands that, uh, uh, for example, a hook is always the possession of the organ, that is the hand. Yeah. The post-human means for, for me precisely this process that human beings ceases to be the bearer of tours. And they were uh, as they were, but rather now it is, it is subsumed to an organizing inorganic. I call it an organizing inorganic, a new form of automation that is very different from Marx's epoch. The organizing inorganic is another name for technical systems which are in the process of realizing under different names, smartification, human enhancement, empowered by technologies such as artificial intelligence, sy uh, synthetic biology. Capital is fundamentally post-human in this sense because it is behind all these technological transformations to realize a global smart logistics based on speed and efficiency. Concerning the future of men, Another paleontologist, also the contemporary of André Le Vagaron, the theologist Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, uh, has proposed a realization of the humanity by the development of the new sphere, a concept that is associated with him and um, Vernadsky, uh, who has proposed the concept of bio, a biosphere. The new sphere is an, uh, what, he, what uh, Teilhard Shadan called added planetary layer produced by and in the process of harmonization. This added planetary layer is leading to a convergence whose evidence could be found in the universalization of, techno of technology 
as Tayhat Shadan has observed, the invention of truers may come from individuals, but the spread of such technology is always planetary. Because the beginning of the use of truer as a biological function to liberate limbs and other organs, uh, the, the constant evolution of technology has produced a very different scene. I quote, when Homo Faber came into being, the first rudimentary tool was born as an appendage of the human body. Today, the tool has been transformed into a mechanized envelope coherent with itself and immensely varied, appertaining to all mankind from being somatic it has become nosferic. That is a quote from an article by a book by him called The uh, Future of Man. It is the, the universalization of the nosferic technology that Taihad Shadan sees a convergence, which is the convergence of all brains to a single brain, a big brain, or the creation of a superorganism, he called it. The modern Earth, which we call an artificial Earth, is now is the realization of such a superorganism, a super brain, which is the collectivity of the individual brains. This moment is also for Tahat Shalan the realization of a collective freedom, even though he didn't just he didn't really justify what really is a collective freedom, and I hope that we have chance to come back to this. But it is clear, it is very clear that what Taihat de Shadan has imagined as the future of man and the future of the earth is a crystal genesis. As a Jesuit, he's trying to combine uh, theology with, uh, together with uh, evolutionary biology. So that is why it is called a crystal genesis. A scientific realization of the kingdom of God on earth. Uh, for myself, I believe that it is necessary to challenge this view, which is now closely re related, associated with transhumanism. Though instead of the word newsphere, they talk more about technosphere, anthropocene, and singularity. This view on the technological future is a refusal uh, of te the techno diversity in favor of a synchronization that is in the process of speeding up. I believe that in order to allow for the techno, uh, for, for the new diversity, uh, the diversity of thinking, it is uh, necessary to reopen the question of techno diversity. To affirm a, a techno diversity is also an attempt to escape the synchronization which characterizes what we call world history. However, it is not a proposal to reject modern, modern technology and retreat to antique cosmology and antique form of life. But then the question is, how is it possible for us to affirm a techno diversity when digital synchronization is omnipresent, when we, when we, uh, when are, um, when we are using more and more or less the same technological applications today and when we are thinking more or less the same under the influence of the market. For sure, the syn synchronicity is not necessarily opposed to diachronicity because synchronicity can also produce diachronicity, that is to say difference. For example, alphabetic writing is a, syn is a synchronicity based on the specialization of sound but it also opens up different interpretations of writing, which are synchronicities. However, a diversity of writing, for example, Chinese, Arabic, uh, English, uh, French writings, some of them have different relations between phonetics and writings. Uh, they together produce a much higher degree of diversity since a form of writing carries in itself already an interpretation of the relation between things and the world. And it is such a characteristic in writing that gives us new diversity, which includes, first of all, different sensibilities. But we are not able to elaborate on the question of sensibility here. Now, if I wanted to invoke 
Heidegger's discourse on technology earlier. It is because I also wanted to show how Heidegger's analysis on techne and the modern technology has also bypassed the question of techno diversity. Because it would be difficult to categorize, for example, Indian, Amazonian, Chinese technologies as the Greek techne. Though we have been consciously or unconsciously doing so since a long time, since centuries. If it is not possible to characterize these other techniques as the Greek techne, then it seems that we will have to articulate these technologies in a more radical and systematic way. Like, for example, the, the historian of science, uh, Joseph Nieham, who has published the uh, 26th or 28th volumes of science and, uh, uh, science and uh, civilization in China, has proposed that there is a completely different uh, technological thought in China, in ancient China. Um, so understanding in this way, we find different relations between cosmologies and te technologies as well as the moral, which vary from one another and irreducible to one another. What do these multiple cosmologies tell, or multiple cosmotechnics tell us today uh, confronting the situation of uh, technological acceleration? And especially when cosmology are reduced to astrophysics, which started since the European modernity, and which the French historian Rémy Barak calls the death, the death of the cosmos. What can it imply today when the rem uh, reminiscence of the modernity is fully exposed in the project of, for example, Elon Musk, in which the cosmic extraction will be soon industrialized? I propose that it is necessary to develop histories of cosmotechnics in order to reflect on the future of technologies and the possibility to develop alternative forms and use of technologies and to re renew relations between culture and nature, technology and nature. However, this question has been hidden at the bottom of the process of modernization, and it is now, I believe, our task to re-articulate it in view of the ecological problems and the, pop and the problem caused by capitalism that we are experiencing, we are living, and as the response to projects such as overcoming modernity or resetting modernity. Uh, I have tried to myself uh, on my part to use China as an example to, to describe an alternative history of technology and suggest that after 150 years of modernization, um, it is urgent to reflect on a new technological future and uh, probably maybe we can say a new form of modernization. But I'm not suggesting that we must abandon technology in favor of non-modern culture, but rather that history can move in a, really, in a very different direction when we escape these oppositions and to think how the non-modern can integrate the modern technology in different ways as well as how modern can transform itself according to different ontologies, epistemologies, um, and I associate this with what Bruno Latour called resetting modernity. Uh, uh, regarding to some concrete examples, that we, I actually have um, uh, an, an example on how to develop different ontology and different epistemologies in order to transform, in order to think, perceive different forms of social networks, uh, to how to reconfigure different uh, social relations. Uh, but I don't think that I have much time left, so I, I, this is an article where, which you can find online that we're trying to suggest uh, new ways to, to, to uh, intervene into, um, by bringing different ontology and epistemology into, into the imagination of technical applications. Uh, I just wanted to simply to conclude that I am convinced that it is possible for us to reflect together what could be done, especially in the domain of art, and we will be able to perceive different technological futures. The division of disciplines, 
in the universities in the 20th century has led to a gap between human sciences and science and engineering. This gap, this gap is now expressed as an outcry of the crisis of the humanities in face of technological acceleration. Uh, Norbert Wiener's cybernetics was a movement which aims to unify, to unify the different disciplines under the rubric of feedback and information. But the cybernetic project failed because it is now only associated with control and denoted with a negative sense. It seems important and urgent to take up again the promise of cybernetics, I believe, but, but this time we will have to think differently, not only to bridge different knowledges and not to construct the unified automatic system that we are witnessing today, but to produce a techno diversity, uh, a different, um, different imaginations of future. And I would like to call this capacity to differ and to defer collective freedom as a response to uh, the discourse of Taya de Chardin. So uh, I will stop here, and I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, I do have a question for you. Yeah. Um, so, so, in your talk, throughout your talk, you mentioned the um, sort of the need for uh, develop uh, new forms of technology, so more of like a, a more radical use of technology, mm. and also new relationships with uh, culture and a new a new relation with what? With Sorry? New relation with what? yeah, uh, culture. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I was thinking while you were saying that, I was thinking. Um, who do you think should take part in defining that use, the new use of technology, the new role, role uh, of technology, and, and also uh, in defining the ethical framework that will guide the next um, sort of mechanical or technological revolution? Um. Oh, so, um, yeah, thank you very much for this question. I mean, uh, there, there is this urgency. I think that we have to open up the question of, uh, of to, to reopen the question of technology because uh, the way we imagine technology, especially from uh, um, um, as we as we see, is always a discourse around a futurism that is based on singularity. Now, so we are moving towards a singular point. And I think that this, uh, this, con this concept of technology or this understanding of technology is a, a very problematic, uh, which also prevents us from thinking about, uh, which I call the, the bifurcation of future. You know, that means that we are uh, moving towards one point, which is the end of history. And how is it possible to reopen the question of technology and uh, it is, the, for me, also the question to uh, rethink the project of modernity. Um, why? Because as I try to explain that the response to uh, or the critique of the modern, of the modern project and the, 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 the solutions are, that has been proposed has been always uh, associated with a return to a, a discourse on nature. You know? as if that in modernity there was a misunderstanding or there was a kind of a, a wrong understanding of nature. But for myself, I think that it is, uh, I, I, I have a, a, a doubt that it is possible to resolve a uh, crisis initi initiated by technology by recurring to concepts that are non-technical, like nature, like organism, uh, where we can find, for example, in the work of Donna Haraway. Uh, that is why I think that uh, we have to reopen the question of, of, of technology. And in order to open the question of technology, is one way of doing that is to radically, uh, see, to see radically that there have been different cosmotechnics. And 
uh, I define cosmotechnics as the following is the unification between the moral order and the cosmic order through uh, uh, technical activities. Now, one way of thinking of this project is, um, uh, well, there are two, two ways of thinking about it. One is, for example, uh, uh, through artistic intervention, so critical artistic intervention. And the other way is to rethink uh, a kind of the role of technology or history of cosmotechnics in different cultures, where we find different relations between human and nature, uh, technology, and the world. And, in, and from there, we try to, concept, to, to rethink a project of, re, of integrating modern technologies, uh, which will be uh, compatible with uh, those forms of living. And I consider this to be an ethical project, um, but it is um, in the sense that it will be, I hope that this will allow us to uh, escape the modern project that is uh, in the process of continuation, as we can see uh, today. And we, I believe that we all feel that today. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you for a very in-depth and very philosophical talk. Um, I was interested in the quote by Putin that you mentioned, whoever leads an AI will rule the world. What does that look like to you, say, um, is that ruling the natural world, militarily, economically, culturally, or a combination? What's your thought? Um, well, I, I think that there is a, a, a problem uh, which is embedded in this sentence, whoever lives in AI will rule the world. Uh, what does it mean by that? Uh, is that the, the acceleration or the aim of AI, as we know, that the, the discourse around AI is the realization of what is called a superintelligence or uh, what was called explosion of intelligence or intelligence explosion. And in this imagination of, uh, of a superintelligence is one that is capable of doing all forms of planning, social pl planning, economic planning. Uh, and this has been a discourse which existed, uh, I think, since decades. And recently, it came to the fore. Um, and I see it as a project of depoliticization. And what does it mean? Why is it a project of depoliticization? Because it will be a project that wanted to rely on the machine to do our planning, to get rid of our human interventions. Why? Because uh, this was also associated with um, the, the m many, well, the fascist movements that we know today, for example, the extreme right, the uh, neo-reactionaries, who proposed that uh, we have to overcome, well, the West has to overcome political correctness, but through depoliticization. Because look at what is happening in China, for example. I don't know so much uh, in Russia. That there is, when there is a new, uh, in the US, we see that when there is a new technology, and what happened will be, there will be, uh, is that there will be an ethical committee that judge if uh, this technology, technology should be applied or developed. No? But this is not the case in countries, for example, like China. You can see that they are doing DNA sequencing of all type of organisms uh, every day. Um, so for the for 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 the neo reactionaries for the uh, for the people from the right wing, they see that in order to re enter or to enter into the competition, then you have to accelerate. To accelerate means that you have to uh, you have to overcome this kind of political intervention, which they call a humanism, a epistemological humanism. So there is a risk here. I see that um, it is. Uh, in, 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 in what Putin has said, whoever lives in AI will rule the world, there is a political, there is an ideology, and this ideology is fundamentally a, a form of depoliticization. Yeah. And that is why I think that we have to raise this question and to think the question of, uh, of uh, techno diversity. 
the question is not whether the super intelligence will arrive or not, whether singularity will arrive or not. That is not uh, really a problem. Why? Because if it will arrive, it will arrive. Uh, but the problem is that it becomes uh, a strong political discourse. It becomes an ideology that we have to fight against. Thank you. Uh, thanks for, for your talk. Um, I was wondering now, um, in your book about the question of technology in China, you um, elaborate on this idea of technological uh, unconsciousness, um, which I think is a very important concept. Um, and uh, then it strikes me to uh, it strikes me to imagine that this technological unconsciousness is pretty much apolitical in the sense that it permeates um, a lot of different political uh, mm. views. And I wonder, in the view of finding a way out towards a technological consciousness, how, how you call it, um, what are the, the best means in terms of, of political and cultural resistance these days? Um, it's probably a very broad question, but even if you just can think of a few examples of how we can move towards that direction. Uh, thank you very much, big questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what, when I say political, when I say technological and consciousness, and which is related to technological consciousness is the foreign, uh, I see that um, that modernity in modernity we find a technological unconsciousness. Uh, why is that? It is because there was a, um, a belief in progress. There is a faith in progress. There is a belief in technological acceleration without reflecting on what is technology, without reflecting on the consequence of such developments. It is like what Nietzsche has described in, in the gay signs. He, said, he described a scene where that a group of people has abandoned the village. They have embarked on a boat, and they have burned their way out. To, uh, they, they have burned the bridge to, 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 to go back to the land. And they start traveling until they were at the, at, at the middle of the ocean, and they find that the most uh, uh, fearful thing the most frightened thing is the infinite, you know, because they're at the mid of the ocean without knowing how to go back. And this is what I call uh, technological unconsciousness. But in, the, in, in what we call the postmodern, it is very clear, for example, in the work of Lyotard, of Jean-François Lyotard, that the question, there is a, 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 a reflection on, on, on what I call technological consciousness, and that we can also find in literatures in 20th century philosophy. Now, this is very much related to the theme of this forum because it is about design, to, uh, to design. And to design, of course, it depends only when we have the technological consciousness that we know that we can design and we must design. You know? But in what way can we think of this? Um, uh, in what way can we think of this, uh, this way out of, uh, uh, of this acceleration from what you said, uh, from the perspective of cultural and, uh, from cultural and uh, 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 resistance? I think that we, for me it is important to enlarge the concept of techniques and to think of different forms of uh, techniques. Well, in, I couldn't elaborate here because it would be too complicated to explain this in 30 minutes. Uh, is that I try to systematically understand uh, what is the history of technological thought in China and how different this technological thought uh, is from the Euro European thought of technology. And from there, I try to think that in what way can we, is it possible to think of a new program of um, uh, integrating uh, technology. Uh, the problem that we have today is that we, I believe that we, technology has been, has become the ground of our cultural development. 
Now, if we see from the perspective of anthropology that the evolution of technology or technology is always situated in a reality which is not technical. Is that, for example, the cosmos. That is the beginning of, uh, if we, we want to derive an anthropological understanding of, of technology. But I think that it is our time that we see that technology become almost the ground of cultural development. You know? And economy, culture are all driven by technology. But is it possible at all to resituate technology in a broader reality, which I called cosmic reality, and that is all the reason for which I called it cosmotechnics. And in order to understand such a cosmo reality, uh, cosmic reality, we need to trace the histories of cosmotechnics. Well, I don't think that there is an immediate solution to the, to the problem uh, that we are witnessing now, but it is possible to start thinking, and this may take uh, many generations to arrive at, this, at that. But, um, it is, um, but we have to bear in mind the question of techno-diversity and its relation to new diversity. I think that is a, a, a kind of paradigm shift that I try to, uh, try to produce. Okay, <clears throat> we have time for one more question. Anyone? Um, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. You. Okay. So, um, next one is.